From Wondery, I'm Stephen Johnson. This is American Innovations. Thank you all for listening to our first series, The Dynamo of DNA. From Mendel's pea plants to the brave new world of genetic editing, we've covered almost 200 years of scientific history. The show has gotten off to a great start, and thank you all so much for the great reviews and feedback. If you love the show and haven't left us a review, please go to Apple Podcasts and do that. American Innovations is pleased to have ZipRecruiter as its presenting sponsor. ZipRecruiter strives to lead the way in innovating how businesses hire. Every business needs great people and a better way to find them. Something better than just posting your job online and praying the right people see it. ZipRecruiter knew there was a smarter way, so they built a platform that finds the right job candidates for you. Their innovations have revolutionized how you find your next hire. We're back this week with Ryan Eberhardt, head of product and senior VP at ZipRecruiter. With Ryan, the product team is constantly working to improve their technology to match employers with the best possible candidates. Stay tuned at the end of this episode to learn more about how ZipRecruiter leads the way in innovation. And now our listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash AI. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash AI. And we're rounding off this first arc in conversation with someone who spent a lot of time immersed in some of these big scientific and ethical questions we've touched on in the series. Britt Ray is a broadcaster and author of the book Rise of the Necrofauna, The Science, Ethics, and Risks of De-Extinction. She's also a co-host of the BBC podcast Tomorrow's World, a show about the big questions about the future. We had a great conversation. Thank you so much for joining us on this special episode of American Innovations. Uh, we really appreciate it. So you are in Copenhagen right now. I am. Yes. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, this is this is great. Now, I, you, you know, you've written this this wonderful book, uh, Rise of the Necrofauna. Fauna, but I, I want to start. Um, we're going to talk about de-extinction, um, but I but I also want to start with the kind of more personal side because. You know, in in the in the recent episodes of American Innovations, we we talked about the the race to um, uh, capture the human genome and the rise of kind of personal genomics. Um, and I know you you have had your own genome sequenced. Um, so I thought we could, we could start talking about that. What first of what 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 motivated you to do this? Was it a research? kind of reporting kind of experience or was it something beyond that? It was mainly motivated by a documentary that I'm making with the National Film Board of Canada about the personal side of personal genomics and the social implications of these new technologies that allow us to look inside our genome and as well as possibly modify the genome. So I was thinking, you know, am I going to put myself in the hot seat in terms of figuring out what this feels like as the individual going through it rather than just talking to other people about it? And I thought it could be really amazing to learn certain things about myself at the genetic level. And I became very curious and thought, you know, even without the documentary, I would now be considering this for myself. And I heard about a project called the Personal Genome Project, which was started at Harvard and under the supervision of George Church and some other researchers, but has expanded to a variety of other places, including Toronto at uh, the Hospital for Sick Children and U of T, where they are collecting genomes from volunteers who are willing to get sequenced and then give over that genetic information to the researchers so that they can put it in an open access database for anyone to be able to do research with that genomic data. And because the data from the sequencing becomes publicly available and published on the internet, there are certain risk factors that come along with that that are a little bit different from just sequencing your data and not publishing it on the internet, let's say. 
But, uh, you know, even though I thought it sounded very interesting, things quickly became complicated once I started going through the consent form process, talking with the clinical geneticist and the ethicist attached to the project and realizing that there are certain things that, you know, are just simply a little bit uh, challenging about going through this that make you vulnerable. So one thing was, of course, that... By deciding to get your genome sequence, you are signing up to learn information about yourself that you can't unlearn after you've heard it. This is not a diagnostic uh, test, but this is an insight into what mutations you have that may increase probabilities to get certain diseases or have certain kind of uh, medical outcomes for your life that you may or may not feel comfortable knowing. I've had genetic researchers throughout this process tell me, you know, I work in this field, but I would never get this done because I'm just too anxious. I'm a worrier. If I heard that I had an increased chance of getting ovarian cancer, I might feel like I'm stringing a sword up above my head and that it could thereby fall at any day in the future. And so these kinds of comments, these offhand conversations with people who knew a lot more than I did were sticking with me and making me a little bit nervous, but I remember that. That reminds me of a. um, I did a a couple of projects um, for books I wrote years ago where I where I did kind of recreationally an fMRI on my brain. (laughs) Oh yeah. And and, you know the whole category of recreational fMRIs is not something that (laughs) generally comes up. But I remember the researchers who were kind of you know running the machines basically saying, "Listen, you know, there's a chance we will see." you know, a brain tumor when we do this scan of your brain, you know, do, do you want to know about it? <laughs> I was like, uh, yes, I would like to know about it. <laughs> I said, yes. I, I, but it's different. I think the, the, the key thing here is that the brain tumor I- exposed in your brain is there 100 percent, right? Whereas this is about risk and, you know, the potential for developing ovarian cancer, you know, 20 years mm-hmm. from now. And and that is a slightly different thing. Obviously, you would want to know, uh, you know, if you actually had something that was actively, you know, a threat to your life um, that was 100 percent there. Um, but probability is a, is a funnier, is, is a kind of a stranger category, I think. It really is. It's tough for the human brain to perceive it in a in a particular way that you know you're going to be able to manage that information in a, in a calm and relaxing mode. I mean, depending on your personality, that might make you worry for the rest of your days or it might make you feel empowered to do the necessary screening to keep on top of this possibility coming into your life. And, uh, you know, other things in the consent form say that very clearly, of course, because you share genetic information with your family, whatever could come up for you also possibly could come up for them. So you're making decisions on behalf of other people to a certain extent in terms of uncovering secrets in your genome that may apply to their genome as well. And when it comes to privacy issues, particularly at that time in Canada, we didn't have a law to protect us from genetic discrimination. If employers or insurance companies found out that you had something that they consider to be unsavory in your genome, where they perceive you to be some kind of risk and they don't want to take you on as an employee, maybe they'd want to fire you, maybe they'd want to resist uh, offering you an insurance policy, then these kinds of real-life consequences come into play, not only for you, but people who share DNA with you. So it's actually quite a bit of risk there thinking about publishing your genome online, and they can't guarantee that you will be um, securely de-identified from the data. Of course, I don't slap my name on my genome that goes online, but people could perhaps do some fancy triangulation and figure out which genome is Brit Ray's. So all these things were pretty scary. Um, And Also, a really sensational line in there was saying that, you know, because you're publishing your unique genome sequences online, someone could take that information, synthesize identical bits of DNA in the lab, and then plant it at a crime scene to frame you, (laughs) which, uh, you know, they put it in there. Sounds pretty sci-fi and out there. However, (laughs) I decided to take the risk. That's a good uh, good Hollywood script, though. (laughs) Uh, And were you doing any of the kind of ancestry uh, kind of sequencing where you're looking at where, you know, where your ancestors came from, or was this mainly looking at kind of health issues? In this particular research project, they're mainly looking just for health. They don't do an ancestral analysis, but you could take that information and send it elsewhere and get it analyzed in a different way. I haven't done that yet. 
Um, but it's, it's great because they do give you these huge files and you can just download your 6.4 billion, I meant to say, of these single letters that make up your, your genome and, and do what you want with it. But, uh, you know, after some thinking and discussion with my family and people that this would implicate, I decided to do it with their agreement and gave my blood. A few months later, this report was emailed to me. And I remember getting it just before going to bed one night and sitting up with my husband looking at it and thinking, oh dear, I should not have opened this without a genetic counselor because I don't know how to interpret what this report says. There were many, many pages uh, showing me that I had links in between my mutations and things in the literature that spelled out so many diseases. There were very crazy words in there, you know, um, muscular dystrophy, uh, dementia with an essential tremor, thyroid cancer, literally the words mental retardation, a variety of things that I didn't know how it could be possible that my genome meant that. Uh, yeah. It reminds me of it reminds me of the early days of the internet. At some point I had um I went through this period where my my big toe was numb for about uh, you know 3 or 4 weeks and so I went you know it was it was when the first generation of kind of health sites like webmd and things like that had come online and so you know I go in and I search like numb big toe and And you just get back this list of, oh, my, apparently I have Ebola. You know, like that was what, exactly. what it seemed like. And so with, I think you're exactly right. Like not having that, that counselor. The, 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 there was no way to frame the, again, the probabilities of it. It just, you know, when you looked at it with a kind of lay person's eye, it just looked terrifying. Exactly, exactly. And I learned my lesson that night. And thankfully, I got an appointment with a genetic counselor very soon after. And she explained, there's only two medically relevant mutations out of that long list that scared me that I actually have to care about and pay attention to. And I found it extremely empowering. One of them was very helpful to learn about because I apparently carry a one mutation whereby if I had two copies, I would express this disease and I would have died by around two months old because it's a debilitating metabolic disorder and I wouldn't be able to thrive in any way. Uh, but I carry one and it's hidden in terms of its expression, but it means that I could pass it on to a potential future child. And she said, but don't worry, you know, this is so uncommon in the global population. There's no way you are ever going to meet anyone who has this like you. The only place where it's somewhat been found is in Scandinavia. <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't know that I'm married to a Danish guy. So that was quite funny, which then opens up possibilities. You know, then you can get screened uh, if you want your partner, um, if your partner wants to get screened for that and make decisions from there on out. I'm sure it's still very rare in Scandinavia, but it was a, it was a funny moment. And then um, generally it's information you can act on in, in ways like that or to get increased screening with your doctor if you are vulnerable to different um, things possibly coming into your life, like different types of cancers or whatever it might be. So I found it to be a fascinating and, uh, yeah, very helpful process in the end, even though it was pretty nerve-wracking at certain points. And then at the end of the day, you've donated something valuable to science. You've given a data set that will help increase discovery rates, hopefully. How does the in a the, tiny, tiny way? How does in terms of the contribution to, you know, kind of open science? How how does that program that you were a part of differ from some of the other, uh, you know, kind of twenty uh, three and Me style um, sequencing services? Oh, that's a good question. Do they have the same level of kind of public contribution? Well, they're actually different analyses of your genetic information. So 23andMe and these direct-to-consumer tests are actually doing what's called genotyping. So they're not sequencing all of the DNA within you. They are just looking for very particular points that they know something quite certain about and then testing to see if you have that variation of that gene in that particular lo loci um, or area of 
the genome, and then they can confirm, yes, you have this trait that leads to um, more solid earwax or more drippy earwax, or you can flush alcohol well or not, or your ancestors seem to have a lot of sex with Neanderthals or not. Um, and, and by looking in these specific ways, they're able to map your genome to a particular tune, but it's not giving you this full library of information, which a lot of we don't even know how to decipher yet when it comes to genome sequencing. So uh, in that way, they're just, they're just different services, but also direct-to-consumer companies like 23andMe, you know, you pay them a little bit of money, they give you this genotyping information about yourself, and then they keep that data, and they can sell it to third parties that want it to do research with, like pharma companies or whatever it might be. Whereas with the Personal Genome Project, they're taking your full genomic data set, and then they're putting it in a database that they make openly available to anyone. And the way that they explained it to me is that if there's a precocious 15-year-old in high school who's staying up late at night trying to come up with the next discovery, they can log on and use those data sets and just download them and run their tests, as well as the most sophisticated medical grade laboratories can use it. So um, they're not selling the data and it's there for anyone. We'll hear more from my conversation with Britt Ray in just a moment. Audiobooks are a great sidekick for summer activities like hiking, sunbathing on the beach, running, road tripping, or lying in the air conditioning to escape the heat. Listening is a better way to binge content you love while doing the things you love. Audible has the largest selection of audiobooks available, so whatever you choose to do, you can do it with audiobooks. Fill your summer with more stories like The Violinist's Thumb by Sam Keen. We've talked a lot about DNA today, and Sam's book goes into even more depth. He shows you how DNA can explain everything from crazy cat ladies to why people have no fingerprints, and how the best violinists on the planet owe a lot to inheriting exceptionally flexible thumbs. Sam is also the author of this arc of American Innovations. So if you're enjoying this episode, I know you'll love this book. Audible members get a credit every month good for any audiobook in their store, regardless of price and unused credits roll over to the next month. Since I know you'll love this book with Audible, you can go back and re-listen anytime, even if you cancel your membership. Start a 30-day free trial, and your first audiobook is free. Go to audible.com slash AI or text AI to 500 500. That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash AI or text INNOVATIONS to 500-500. Whatever you do this summer, do it with Audible. Now, back to my conversation with Britt Ray. Do you think, having gone through this experience, that this is going to be, in a matter of years, uh, something that happens by default to most people um, as part of their just basic medical care? You know, I do. Um, if we look at how quickly the p costs of DNA sequencing have plummeted, between 2009 and 2014, the cost of sequencing a whole genome dropped in a way that's equivalent to a $100 meal in 2009, costing only 50 cents in 2014. So it, that price drop has continued. You know, we've already seen the $1,000 genome achieved, and people are talking about the $100 genome. What if it gets down to $10 eventually? The accessibility of being able to look inside people's cells and spell out their unique genetic code becomes more available and accessible. And importantly, we're seeing how helpful it is, particularly when people are on these genetic odysseys and they're trying to figure out what might be wrong with them and the clues uh, can very valuably be drawn from genome sequencing to figure out what's going on in many medical cases. So the bigger question around when and how is uh, the, the regulation and privacy of that information and how it might become widespread. I think technologically we'll, it will become more accessible. That's not really a question. Um, but how will we then work with that at a societal level to make sure that people's genetic privacy is ensured and that people across the board won't be discriminated for this kind of information being revealed about them so that doctors and healthcare providers can use that data to the best of their abilities to have the best healthcare outcomes. It's, it's, it's a whole world of kind of ethical questions 
that we still have to wrestle with here. You know, there's just a, 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 a it creates a set of one opportunities, but also potential conflicts uh, and potentials for abuse that human beings have really never had to wrestle with before. Did you, did you follow the um, Golden State Killer case out here in, in yeah. the United States? What, so yeah. we, we mentioned this briefly in the show, but if people didn't get it, basically they they were able to track down this killer who's been on the loose for 30 years, uh, I believe, since the first crimes he committed, because of – not because of his DNA, but because a relative of his had 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 part of their genome sequenced, uh, I think, with one of the, these direct-to-consumer programs. And uh, and that enabled them eventually to, to – uh, you know, capture this guy. And so on the one hand, a killer um, and rapist, uh, uh, you know, is behind bars after 30 years uh, escaping law enforcement. On the other hand, the, you know, he, one of his relatives actually indirectly um, kind of revealed his identity to the police through w- without realizing they were doing it at all. Um, so it, it, it's a very perplexing case in terms of what we should be allowed to do. What, do you have any thoughts on it? It's a fascinating case because, yeah, as you mentioned, this killer's relatives had used one of these direct-to-consumer genotyping programs, but then taken an extra step and uploaded that information to one of these sites where you can look for relatives that you may not know you're actually related to. And by matching DNA sets, they can show you, oh, you happen to have a cousin over in Kentucky, or here's your brother you never knew. And it's bringing and people your, together. Here's your in... serial killer cousin. <laughs> yeah, here's your serial killer cousin. And, uh, you know, the thing with these sites is that it hasn't been extremely clear when signing up for them, that you are making people in your family, whether or not you know you're related to them, vulnerable to different forms of detection and tracking and putting their genetic privacy in a vulnerable position. So I think people are now rejigging their awareness of that and trying to make that more explicit. But uh, yeah, when you're just following the line, so this person wanted to find out about their DNA, they did that, then they uploaded it to a site to see if there's any other relatives out there. Okay. Couldn't have predicted that then Law enforcement is going to make uh, an imposter profile, go on that site, pretend to look for relatives, but really just use the killer's DNA from the crime scenes that they've captured over the years and see if there's any matches and very quickly close in on a group of relatives to the killer, even though the killer hasn't signed up themselves. I mean, that's amazing. It's it's effective um, in terms of targeting wrongdoers, but what does that mean for the rest of us? I think it just points out that this data is very powerful and it's being used in ways that we could not have predicted just a few years ago. And we can only assume that more cases are going to surprise us like that. I think the the general lesson is if you are going to sign up for a service like this, you want to contact all the murderers in your extended family and just make sure it's okay with them. (laughs) You know? Yeah, exactly. Just, just to be polite. Right? <laughs> you know, it's yeah. just the kind of the ethical thing to do. Okay, so let's move on to another related field that is uh, has its own set of fascinating ethical uh, dilemmas. Uh, one that you've written an entire book about, a terrific book called "Rise of the Necrofauna." So, first off, just explain to us what necrofauna are. Sure. Necro meaning like Latin prefix for dead or death, and fauna like flora and fauna. So necrofauna just refers to dead animals. Well, as you may be able to tell, necrofauna is kind of a made-up word. But I did first hear it uttered by a futurist by the name of uh, Alex Steffen, who had used it to refer to this question of what kinds of extinct species will advanced biotechnologists try to recreate now that we are close to being able to do that? Will they just choose those iconic, majestic, beautiful, long-gone species that hold a special place in our heart because they're charismatic, they're, you know, gorgeous, they look at us with some kind of spark of intelligence and we miss them or we feel guilty for making them go extinct? Or will we maybe make you know more sound choices based on ecology and maybe choose some more mundane species? Because in 
this world, which is now referred to as an emerging field of de-extinction, where scientists are trying to create close versions of extinct species, we hear a lot about the woolly mammoth, the passenger pigeon, the Tasmanian tiger, the gastric brooding frog, which spit its young up out of its mouth. That was pretty sensational to see. I mean, these are quite incredible creatures that capture the hearts and minds of people and can maybe galvanize interest to get them back. And so the question is, are we just going to recreate animals that make us feel good in some way, or will we be a bit more um, open to less charismatic species also fitting the bill? I, I think that, the, you know, the, the second question is also just kind of a reality check question. So having spent you know, years researching this, talking to a lot of the people like George Church and Stuart Brand and Ryan Phelan who were involved in this project. Um, what What's your general kind of gut sense of the plausibility of it all? I mean, is is this, are you are you feeling this, this is, re- reviving something like a woolly mammoth is absolutely within our powers over the next <clears throat> 5, 10, 15 years? Or is there still an open question of whether this is even going to be technically possible? So I don't think it's possible to recreate the woolly mammoth. What instead is possible is to create some kind of hybrid animal that comes close to it, but is never going to be an exact copy of what has been lost. I mean, once an entire way of life, once the species and an entire genetic lineage has been wiped off the face of the earth, extinction is still real. It's permanent. They're gone. But using cloning and backbreeding and genome editing techniques, we can create animals that are similar to varying extents uh, to these extinct species that we're trying to model these new animals after. And there are some really, really uh, sophisticated scientists in terms of what they've achieved already working on this. So that puts the potential of these projects um, working based on their progress so far up there, but I just mean to make the point that we can't undo extinction. Instead, we can make these facsimiles or proxies or hybrids that are kind of mimics of the extinct ones. So in George Church's lab right now at Harvard, they've got a bunch of dishes with Asian elephant cells in them. Asian elephants are the closest living relatives to the woolly mammoth. And by going into the genetic sequence, of the woolly mammoth, which different teams around the world have been able to sequence and compare so that they then understand what certain genetic uh, mutations did for the traits created in the woolly mammoth, such as you know the genes that would create that thick, iconic, shaggy hair or smaller ears as compared with elephants so that less heat would escape when they're in the Arctic and fatty insulating skin and importantly, the ability to bind and release oxygen in its blood at freezing temperatures. If you can take those uh, g- genetic changes from the woolly mammoth and then edit them into its closest living relative, the Asian elephant, which is what they've done, and then test out to see what those genetic changes have as an effect on the elephant cells, you start to look into see, okay, how realistic will this become to then making all these changes in an elephant embryo and implanting it somewhere like a, a uterus of a surrogate elephant or even an artificial womb in order to grow that embryo into a fetus and then into a woolly mammoth elephant hybrid. And that's the pathway that they're on right now. So far, they've made well over 50 woolly mammoth specific genetic changes in the Asian elephant cells. And they've claimed that, you know, within the next year or so, they might be able to make all these edits in a master cell, aka an embryo. And that would be the next step towards implantation. You know, it's fascinating just thinking about given how intelligent elephants are as a species, you can imagine the elephant mother giving birth to this shaggy haired, <laughs> small eared <laughs> child and being like, well, that, you don't appear to be an elephant. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, just, just experientially, I would imagine they would be smart enough to recognize that, uh, you know, this offspring has some fundamental difference from. A weird haircut. Yeah, exactly. You're listening to a conversation that I had with writer and broadcaster Britt Ray. More in just a moment. American Innovations is brought to you in part by Wix.com. You can showcase your bright ideas and innovations with Wix. They've developed artificial design intelligence that creates a stunning website for you. And now you can create your website right from your phone, which means you can open up your online store, portfolio, blog, 
wherever you are, even while listening to this podcast. Here's what you do. Go to Wix.com, decide what you need a website for, pick your style, add your own images, and just like that, your website is ready. Seriously, it's that easy. You'll look amazing on every device, desktop and mobile, and it takes less than five minutes. If only everything in life could be so simple. Great innovators can change the world, but first, the world has to know about you. So what are you waiting for? It's time to get started. Go to Wix.com, that is W-I-X.com, and create your very own beautiful professional website today. We now return to the last part of my conversation with Britt Ray, author of Rise of the Necrofauna, The Science, Ethics, and Risks of De-Extinction. So obviously one of the things about this is there, there is the fascination with reviving extinct species just to see them back in the world, and that's what you know the kind of Jurassic Park mythology is, is all about. But a key thing here is the impact of bringing these species back to ecosystems um, that they once played a critical role in. And the idea with the mammoths, for instance, is yes, you won't be able to recreate a mammoth, uh, you know, in its entirety, but that mammoth-elephant hybrid might be close enough to the original woolly mammoths to play the same role in its original ecosystem. Uh, that the mammoths did. So you're restoring some of that ecological balance by reviving these species. That That's a key part of this, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's the the crux of the, the justification for why de-extinction should happen um, that's put forth by researchers who are making these projects, uh, basically uh, turning them from a, a fiction into somewhat of a reality. They say that if there's a certain species that had an important functional role to play in an ecosystem – which has disappeared, and of course, once it went extinct, its ecological role went extinct too, then if we can create some animal that has the traits of the extinct animal that would allow it to live out that ecological role again, because it's physiologically similar enough and behaviorally similar enough, then reintroducing a recreated population of those mimics of the extinct species would maybe allow us to get the productivity of that ecosystem back to the way that it was when the extinct species carried out the role. And that's that's being applied to the woolly mammoth because the idea here is to actually return them to the Siberian tundra. Right. Uh, one of the things that I have thought about a lot and written about in terms of technology and, and science, and I think this would certainly apply in this case, is Whenever you have complex systems with you know multiple you know thousands of different variables um, interacting as in an ecosystem as in uh, you know the genome of a of a species, whenever you meddle in that world, you you end up with unintended consequences um, that you didn't mm-hmm. anticipate. There's always unknowns that are unknown involved, right? And uh... When it comes to ecosystems, there's this great saying that ecosystems are not just more complex than we currently think, they're more complex than we can think. I mean, how can we perceive all the possible emergent situations that will come from embarking on these grand experiments and inserting new forms of life into really complex webs and dynamics of life that are always in flux and changing? So, of course, there's different kinds of modeling that can be done, but I don't think anyone working with those models says that they are a secure way to make sure that everything's been thought about and considered and that there's been kind of backup plans uh, tested in order to deal with what might happen. But there are a lot of people speculatively debating what might happen with these de-extinction projects and trying to think as much as possible, how can we take the lessons that we've learned from species management and conservation, you know, species translocations, um, types of captive breeding programs that then return animals into the wild. How can we take all that knowledge on how to do that successfully and make it relevant for de-extinction because it seems like this is coming down the pipe whether we like it is or not and this is what the international union for the conservation of nature the iucn which is the global authority on endangered species has said they manage the red list and you know which says such and such species is endangered to this extent and They've created an expert committee that has published an official guideline report on de-extinction saying, based on everything we've learned in conservation, this is how we think you should approach 
a de-extinction project, if you have a candidate in mind, make sure that you run that candidate species through this tier of scrutiny in order to make some sound decisions. So these are questions such as, you know, is there available habitat? Because if you're saying that this is not to create scientific oddities to put in a zoo and entertain people or to sell the meat of or whatever it might be, then they need to be able to manage it themselves on their own in the wild. So is there habitat with available food sources that is not going to come under huge amounts of threat from impending climate change, for example, that would upend the habitat? Can we ensure that? What about human populations? Has a lot of research been done to know that human populations living near that vicinity would be peacefully happy to have them there? Or might there be threats to the well-being of those human communities, or might they want to profit from these animals in some way that would be unecological? We need to make sure that these animals are protected and that humans won't make them go extinct again, because in many cases we made them go extinct the first time. Um, and then there's, you know, questions about parasites and um, all sorts of pressures that might be put on the potential lives that would be created through de-extinction that you want to think about first in order to see, yeah, this could possibly work and make a population that would be able to sustain themselves without human management after a certain amount of time. But I wouldn't say that it's it's easy to say that everything can be predicted. No. Yeah, yeah. There's so many questions. Um, uh, so the, the the last thing I wanted to ask you about is actually just from a great uh, quote from from your book, Rise of the Necrofauna, that uh, that that shows up near the end. I'll just read this passage here. Whatever we choose, we need to step up to the plate of responsibility and re reevaluate the possibilities for what comes next. The extinction will give birth to much more than unextinct creatures in a lab. It will give birth to new social and scientific practices, cultures, laws, attitudes, values, and beliefs. We must seriously ask ourselves what de extinction will do to species, but we should not forget to ask also what will de extinction do to us. And I guess my question is it's a beautiful passage. And my question is do, do we have the institutions to, to make those kinds of decisions now? Like who, who gets to decide? And what, what, what do we need to invent new kind of ethical kind of scientific decision-making bodies that can steer us in the right direction? Or do we have those resources already? I don't think we do have the resources already at a global scale to be able to really have meaningful engagement with each other across the board to figure out how we want to move forward with the power of these technologies or not. There are some good attempts, um, and especially when it comes to how things like genome editing are relating to human genetic modification, you know, with CRISPR um, for medical applications. Um, and de-extinction certainly d does not get nearly that much attention. And also, I just want to point out, no one... Uh, as Brian Phelan has said very clearly before, no one gets rich off of conservation. So there's not the same, same kind of attention put on these areas of how synthetic biology and conservation biology are coming together as compared with how these powerful tools are getting used for possible medical therapies. But, um, you know, there is not this one global authority that will be able to institute a way that is ethically sound going forward. We need to wrestle with different local cultural values and share that with each other but it's a slow and soft process and we i think we need to know that you know mistakes it's will happen. Mistakes will happen along the way. We need to re react to them responsibly. But I've seen some heartening attempts to propose new institutions, like a global observatory that was proposed in nature not too long ago for human gene editing, where we can come together in a much more thorough way to try and decide if we're going to draw lines in the sand or not. And similarly, when it comes to changing our own social expectations or political expectations of these kinds of technologies as it relates to the non-human natural world, we could consider something like that too. But as it currently stands, I mean, countries get to decide what happens legally within their borders. And it seems to be mainly jurisdictionally um, f figured out at that level for de-extinction. And uh, that's where a lot of the interesting regulatory questions come from. It's still these traditional models of looking within nation states and laws. There's a lot still to figure out. Well, Britt Ray, thank you so much for joining us on American Innovations. Uh, and uh, we look forward to chatting again in the future when we, we've learned more. <laughs> it was great to be with you. Thank you for having me. 
And that's a wrap on The Dynamo of DNA. If you liked our conversations with Britt, you can follow her on social media at Britt Ray on Twitter. And her website is BrittRay.com. You can also pick up her book, Rise of the Necrofauna, The Science, Ethics, and Risks of De-Extinction, for more. We'll be back with an all-new American Innovations arc all about nuclear energy. And we're starting off that series by looking at another building block of life, the indestructible atom. New episodes of American Innovations come out every Thursday. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. If you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe over the cover art of this podcast. You'll find episode notes, including some details you might have missed. You'll also find some offers from our sponsors. Please support our show by supporting them. And thank you. Innovation often comes from constant evaluation. If you're not honestly assessing how something is working, you'll never be able to change, even if everything is working great right now. Businesses of all sizes trust ZipRecruiter, but according to Senior VP and Head of Product, Ryan Eberhardt, that doesn't mean the ZipRecruiter team is finished with their product. We get together every week as a team, often with the CEO, and we do a deep dive into every aspect of the product experience, and we look at measurements of customer engagement with all of the key parts of the product. And we are basically constantly asking ourselves the question, is this the best version of our service imaginable and how can we make it better? And it's a, it's a commitment to a process of continuous innovation that has led to every kind of breakthrough in the product at ZipRecruiter over the seven years. If you're like me, you want things to change right now. But that's not the best environment for innovation. Most people imagine innovation striking like lightning on Ben Franklin's kite, but that is not how it works. Uh, innovation is a, is a 10x improvement, not a 1% improvement. It's the kind of game changer that you're looking for. And at ZipRecruiter, we are on a mission to continuously introduce those game changers over time. Thanks to those game changing innovations, ZipRecruiter has been able to revolutionize how you find your next hire. ZipRecruiter's powerful technology scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and invites them to apply to your job. In fact, 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. And you can try it right now for free. Just go to this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash AI. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash AI. One more time, ZipRecruiter.com slash AI. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. American Innovations is hosted by me, Stephen Johnson. This episode is produced by George Lavender. Executive producers are Hernan Lopez and Marshall Louis for Wondery. If you'd like to hear more of American Innovations and other Wondery shows, in addition to extra content, early access, and exclusive perks, you can subscribe to Wondery Plus. Go to wondery.com slash plus. That's P-L-U-S. We'll see you there. <laughs>